Hello everybody, welcome back to Monte Carlo Methods. In today's video, we're not gonna actually do Monte Carlo Methods. Rather, we're going to prep for the next video where we're gonna look at output of our built-in random number generators and try to evaluate whether or not they're doing a good job. To do this, we're gonna run some statistical tests and we're gonna need to know a little bit about some statistics. Now, if you've had a course in mathematical statistics, you are good to go. If you've had another course in statistics, you also may be good to go. The things you need to know are about expected values, variances, the idea that a sample mean is a new random variable with its own distribution, and a little bit about the central limit theorem. If these four things make sense to you now, you might want to skip this video or better yet, go to the end in the description box below and check out a very short lab in Python or R. For those of you that may need this background, stick around. And if we're going to go kind of fast in here, so if this is too difficult, you might want to consider looking at the first four to five videos of my mathematical statistics course. Random variables, they can be discrete, they can be continuous, they can be mixed, having discrete and continuous components. They can be one-dimensional, they can be high-dimensional, they can be almost anything you can imagine. But let's start with a one-dimensional discrete random variable. I'm going to call it capital X. It takes on values little x, where little x could be 0, 1, or 2, and the probability that x is 0, 1, or 2 is 1 fourth, 1 fourth, and 1 half, respectively. Now, the mean or expected value or expectation of x is the probability weighted average of these values. So I'm going to take 0 times 1 fourth plus 1 times 1 fourth plus 2 times 1 half, and we get 5 fourths. This is like an average of the values 0, 1, and 2, but it weights the higher probability values more. In general, the mean, expectation, or expected values, these are all terms for the same thing, of a random variable is denoted by a capital E of X. I'm partial to brackets. Some people use parentheses. And for a discrete random variable, it's defined to be the sum of each possible value X times the probability that the random variable capital X takes on the value little x. Now, this sum should be over the support of your distribution, the places where it is meaningful and the probabilities are non-zero. In our example, X would be 0, 1, and 2 but it doesn't hurt to throw more x's in here because if you try to find the expected value for the previous distribution and sum over 0, 1, 2, and 3, and 4.5, those last two values will disappear because the probability that x is equal to 3 or 4.5 is 0. So it doesn't hurt to throw more numbers in. Note that the expected value of x is not random. We've averaged the randomness out. A common symbol to denote the expected value of x is a Greek letter mu for mean. Now mu, or the expected value of x, is a measure of location for the distribution. It's kind of a central value, and it's not in the center literally of the numbers like 0, 1, and 2, because that would be 1, but it is in the center when you weight the values by their respective probabilities. So in our example, we saw that we actually got 5 fourths, a little bit more than 1, and that's because the value 2 had more weight or probability than the values 0 and 1. The variance of this distribution or any distribution is a measure of how spread out it is. So uh, a distribution that takes on the values 0, 1, and 2 million is kind of spread out. Uh, our distribution, maybe not so much, but it's all relative. The variance for a random variable x is denoted by VAR of x, square brackets or parentheses. Some people just use the letter V. And it's defined to be the expected value or probability weighted average of the squared deviations of the random variable from its mean mu. Why do we use a squared? We could use an absolute value, but that makes the math positively icky. We have a lot of nice results with a square in it, and we don't want to drop the square entirely because this expectation by design will always be zero if we do that. Again, this variance is not random, and again, it gets a Greek letter. It's usually denoted by a sigma squared. Now here, we are taking the expectation not of x, but of a function of x. And this is a new random variable. You might call it capital Y. So capital Y defined as x minus mu, that's capital X, still random, all squared, has its own distribution, its own probabilities, its own table with three values. 
To compute this, you're going to need to find the new values for y. We started with 0, 1, and 2 for x's, and that would correspond to 0, 1, and 4 for the y's with the same probabilities. This can be much more complicated when you are looking at a more complicated function of x or a uh, distribution x that has many more values or is continuous or is high dimensional. So the good news for you is that you do not need to transform the probabilities. This expectation here turns out to be the same thing as an expected value using the probabilities for x. And instead of putting a little x in front of the probabilities, we put a little x into the function we're taking the expectation of. This is known as the law of the unconscious statistician, I think because people kind of do this without thinking. And if you want to see why this is true, you're going to need to know a little bit more about transforming distributions which is something you can learn in a course in mathematical statistics. Expectation is a linear operator. For example, if you take the expected value of like ax plus by, where x and y are random variables and a and b are constants, you'll get a times the expected value of x plus b times the expected value of y. This is not that hard to show. It is using a linearity property of the sum here but also maybe some notions about transforming from one distribution to another, because if you're taking the expectation of a function of two random variables like x and y, you do need to think about a joint probability mass function for those random variables, technically. So the variance being the expected value of x minus mu all squared, if you square that out and run the expectation through like the linear operator it is and simplify things, you will end up with the expected value of x squared minus the expected value of x all squared. The second term here, at least inside the squared, is mu and it's a constant. And the expected value of x squared we can compute using the law of the unconscious statistician. We're going to sum over all little x, little x squared, times the probability that capital X, the random variable, equals little x. This right here is the thing we've been calling the probability mass function and denoting by an f of x. So we can certainly substitute that in. Suppose now that x is a continuous random variable. We talked about how this means that the probability that x equals any one particular number is always zero because there's just too many possibilities. Remember we talked about, I think, heights and the probability of being in an interval then being in a much smaller interval. That would be a smaller probability. And it's vanishing and shrinking when you get down to a point. So we're going to use the formula that we had at the end of the last slide the sum with the probability mass function f of x in it, but we're going to replace that f of x with the probability density function for a continuous random variable, and we're going to swap out the sum for an integral. Here I've integrated over the whole one-dimensional space from minus infinity to infinity, but your random variable might only take on values from 0 to 1 or negative 1 to 10 or whatever. This PDF should take care of it, though. It'll be 0 in the places you need it to be 0. For computing the variance, and by the way, the variance is defined in exactly the same way it was before as an expectation or a difference of expectations, that's exactly the same. For The variance is exactly the same. It's just computing those expectations is a little different. The analogous formula for computing the expected value of the random x squared is going to be the integral of lowercase x squared times x with the probability density function. Again, I guess I just said this, but we can do the same uh, calculations by squaring out x minus u and running the expectation through. And we can compute a variance not by doing that big expectation with the mu and the squared, but by doing these two individual expectations. Okay, suppose I have a list of random variables, x1, x2, x3, out through xn. Suppose these are all independent of each other, and suppose they have the exact same distribution. So maybe they all have an exponential distribution, but that's not enough to say they have the exact same distribution. We need them to have, in this case, the exponential distribution with one rate that's shared by all of them. I'm going to let mu be the expected value of x1. Since this is computed using an integral and using the PDF or probability density function of this exponential distribution in that example, not on my slide, but the example I just talked about, all of these random variables have the same distribution. They have the same probability density function. The integrals will all be the same. They all have the same common mean. So we only need one Greek letter for it. We're going to call it mu. 
sigma squared, the variance of x1 is also going to be the common variance for x1, x2 out through xn. Let's actually look into the exponential example just a little bit more. When you have independent and identically distributed random variables from a distribution, you would denote that by saying x1 comma x2 out through xn, and then this squiggly line means has the distribution. You'd write the name of the distribution there, and usually you would put the letters iid over that squiggly line. This stands for independent and identically distributed. In this particular example, the mean for any one of these x's is 1 over lambda, and the variance for any one of these x's is 1 over lambda squared. Remember, you may parameterize your exponential distribution a little bit differently. So if you're just looking in a book and you see an exponential with a lambda in there, it might actually be the reciprocal of the parameter I'm using here, so watch out for that. This up here is known as a random sample from the exponential distribution with rate lambda. The phrase random sample is equivalent to saying that they are IID. So if you have a random sample from a distribution, they are independent and identically distributed. There's no need to say that again. For this sample, we can compute a sample mean. We're going to call it capital X bar. Before you actually observe these values or simulate these values, we still don't know what they are. X1, X2, X3, these are random variables that we'll eventually observe. But before we observe them, if we consider averaging all n of them like this, this is another random variable. It has its own distribution, it has its own mean, and it has its own variance. Let's check out the mean for x bar. I am going to call it mu sub x bar. And this is going to be my notation for the expected value of x bar, which is the expected value of 1 over n times the sum as i goes from 1 to n of the capital xi. Using the fact that expectation is a linear operator, I can pull out the 1 over n, I can pull out the sum, and in here I have the expected value for each xi, but they're all the same. Every one of them is mu. So this sum here looks like mu plus mu plus mu n times. It's really n times mu multiplied by this 1 over n out here, which cancels with that n inside, and we end up with just mu. Let's look at the variance for x bar. The variance for x bar is the variance of this expression here. Now, because of the squared thing in the definition of the expectation for variance, if you multiply by a constant, it turns out you can plot the constants, but they come out squared. Hopefully, this is stuff you've seen before. If I'm losing you, again, I would recommend looking into the first several lectures of mathematical statistics. So I'm going to pull out that constant squared and sums. Sums do not pull through variances in general. This is for the same reason that a plus b squared is not the same thing as a squared plus b squared. The squared and sums, they don't mix well. However, we can show that if our random variables are independent as they are in our random sample case, the sum will come outside the variance. In the next video, we'll see some cases where we compute a variance of a sum where we do not have independent terms, so I'll save that for next time. But if you take the sum of the individual variances, which are all sigma squared, this sum is n times sigma squared, and that n will cancel with one of the n's down here, leaving us with sigma squared over n. It should feel good to you that the variance for the sample mean is smaller than the original variance. We're taking the original variance for the individual random variables and dividing by n. So if n is large, especially, we're going to get a very small variance here. The thing is that sample means just don't vary as much as individual values. So imagine you're at a university and there's 20 recitation sections for your favorite subject, and there's 2,000 students that are equally divided into those recitation sections. They all take exam one. Grades on exam one could vary quite a bit. Unfortunately, some people do even get zeros and some people get bonus points over 100. But if you go into each of the 20 recitation sections and look at the average value of the test scores, those are not going to vary nearly as much. It will be hard for an entire class to have an average of zero or over 100. So it is making sense that the variance of the sample mean is smaller than the original variance. So I said that x bar has its own distribution. We just defined its mean and variance. And its distribution is going to depend on the underlying original distribution for x1 through xn. I'm actually out of the exponential example right now. So suppose I just have an x1 through xn iid or a random sample from any distribution with mean mu and variance sigma squared. If sigma squared is finite, the famous central limit theorem kicks in and says that the distribution of the sample mean 
which is a random variable, is approximately normal for large samples. Now, there's a formal statement to be made here involving convergence and distribution, and that is definitely a mathematical statistics subject. You'll be okay for this course, though, if you know that sample means have approximately a normal distribution for large sample sizes. Large in statistics and data science is usually considered a sample size n of greater than 30 or greater than 40. I think these are both horrible approximations to infinity, but they work quite well in most cases. It's going to be really dependent on the underlying distribution. And we're going to look at an example in the lab in the description box below. So it has a normal distribution. What does its mean and what is its variance? We already computed those for a general sample mean. The mean is going to be the original mean mu for the individual x's, and the variance for x bar is going to be the original variance sigma squared divided by n. To see this in action, to see very not normal random variables turn into averages that are normal random variables, check out the code in the description box below. Just like me generating one number for you and getting 0.645231788833, you cannot see the uniform distribution until I generate a lot of numbers for you. Similarly, you can't see the central limit theorem working until I generate a lot of sample means. That is, I'm going to generate a sample of size 40 or larger and then compute the average and then get a whole new sample and compute the average, get a whole new sample, compute the average, we're going to simulate many values of x bar and see that they start to take on the shape of the normal distribution. With that, you're ready for the next video. I will see you then.